But in today's passage, we're actually going to look at two of Jesus' healing miracles uh, within this one story. Uh, I want to take this like we would a Bible study almost. We're going to look at this in three different parts, and we are going to put ourselves in that situation, in that time frame, and then also what it means to us today and how it applies to our spiritual life. So the first part that we're going to look at is Mark, we're in Mark chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 21 through 28 to start. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell to his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal of care under, great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all, all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she actually grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Okay, we're going to stop here and look at these verses. So we have two individuals. There's actually three people in this story. We have the crowd, other than Jesus and the disciples. We have the crowd, we have Jairus, and we have this unnamed woman. The two people, the unnamed woman and Jairus, they are both in desperate need of Jesus, and they both believe that Jesus can help their situation. So first we look at Jairus. This is a ruler of the synagogue, which means he was wealthy, he was influential, member of the community. And then on the other side of the society, we have this unnamed woman. Now if we look at Jairus, he's the type of person who people would have came to him begging for favors. But in these verses, we see that he goes to Jesus and he throws himself at his feet, begging for help showing how desperate he is because his daughter is dying, and he believes that Jesus can heal her. And in contrast, we have the woman who remains a nameless member of the crowd, but she's desperate for healing too. She's been dealing with this medical issue and bleeding for 12 years. She spent all of her resources on these doctors, and things have only gotten worse. The condition's gotten worse. And her situation also poses the danger of ritual impurity for anyone that comes in contact with her. So this means that she was probably subject to social isolation for 12 years. Just chew on that for a second. We went through, what, a year? 12 years. Which means if anyone were to come in contact with her, they would have to go through this purification process in order to return to society before they could go worship, before they could offer up any sacrifices to atonement for their sin against others or God. It was a process. So people probably stayed away from her for 12 years. Jairus gets Jesus' attention in the crowd. And Jesus, imagine at this time, um, we kind of talked about this with the children. Like, imagine if Jesus was like a person in today's society and how with our social media and how famous he would probably get these miracles blowing up, right? But imagine what it's like if you were to meet somebody famous. Think about the crowd. And, and that's kind of what's happening here. He's traveling around the Sea of Galilee. The miracles that he performs, the news is spreading about him. He's starting to grow, draw a crowd everywhere that he goes. So I don't know if you guys have ever met anybody famous or got to see one of your favorite like bands perform or if you've gotten to see anything like that. Imagine the crowd and if there was like no security or anything. How unruly that would be. You're trying to get to this person to get a picture or an autograph. Put yourself in that situation. That's kind of what we're looking at here. The vast crowd that this individual would draw would be very difficult to get to that person unless you were the right person, right? Well, Jairus was the right person. He was able to get to Jesus because of who he was. Now, the unnamed woman, she was not the right person. She was boxed out. 
She had to fight through this crowd to get to Jesus. And Jairus had Jesus' attention. They're now taking this crowd to his house for Jesus to see his daughter. But that didn't stop the woman from trying to fight through the crowd to get to Jesus. This story, and I don't really usually move around up here, but I'm going to today, um, just for more visual representation or illustration. So we're going to use the Jesus doll. Jesus doll is going to be, Jesus will be portrayed by the Jesus doll. So this story kind of reminds me of our faith journey, right? There are times when we first start believing in Jesus, we maybe we get baptized, we first believe in Christ, we go to church, we get plugged in, and man, it feels like we are just holding hands with Christ. We are on the spiritual high, nothing can take us off of this mountain place. This is where we are. We are side by side with him, and everything's great. Everything's fine. And then things start happening in our life, right? Time passes by, our relationship kind of fades. Maybe we don't spend as much time with him in the Word. And it's okay, we can sleep in this Sunday morning. We don't need to go to Sunday school. And we don't need to go to church this Sunday. Um, or things just happen. We stop. It's the same way with our relationships in real life. We sometimes lose contact. We don't talk to him as much as we should. We're not as close as we should be. We don't put in as much effort. So we kind of fade off a little bit. Um, and then we kind of stop investing into this relationship. But then we start going on retreats. Maybe we go, you know, to resurrection. Oh, where'd Jesus go? You did it too soon. <laughs> Next time. Next time. <clears throat> so we go to all these retreats. We go to Christian concerts. We go, we see like a movie that we like, or we get plugged into a small group or Bible study. And then we are back on track with God. We feel like we're right there with him again. And then the same thing happens. We lose our determination. That fire quickly fades. And then we slowly fade out of that relationship with him. And then there are other times we feel like the woman, right? We so desperately want to be with Christ that we miss that relationship. We know what it was like because we've been there and we're struggling. We want to be with him again. So we're fighting, we're clawing, we're pushing through the crowd. We're pushing people aside. We are doing everything we can. It seems like it's harder this time. We're doing Bible study. We're trying to get plugged into the church. Things just don't feel right. Even when we're worshiping, we're not really into it. And then we get there and he's gone. Jesus is with somebody else, or so it seems. Even all this hard work that we're doing, he's still so far away. It's kind of what someone is feeling like. Why, why is Jesus with Jairus? I need him too. I'm fighting for my life to be with him. I desperately want to be with him, and I can't. I just, if I could just touch his clothes, if I could just get close enough one more time to touch his clothes and to be with him again, I could feel that spiritual rejuvenation. I could feel like I'm on fire for God again. I could feel the Holy Spirit if I could just get close enough but it seems like he's focused on somebody else. He's helping somebody else. Jesus is blessing them, and he can't see me in the crowd. If only we could get close enough, we could possibly have that better relationship. We could see a miracle. We could get the healing, whether it's physical or spiritual, that we desperately need. But we can't. Let's see what happens next. In verses 29 through 34. So immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So immediately, this miracle happens. The bleeding stops. She was healed. 
<laughs> yeah, I love what Jesus does next. It's kind of, uh, he does this a lot with the re religious leaders and stuff, but I love how he does this with his disciples. It's just kind of like, hey, who touched me? And, and the disciples are looking at him like he's crazy. You see the crowd around us, they're all eager, they want, they're, they, they're curious about you, they're pushing us. I mean, they're probably getting pushed as, as Jesus is asking them this. They're all getting pushed and shoved into Jesus. And they kind of look at him and say, seriously? Can't you see all these people pushing us, like right now even? And you want to know who touched you? But Jesus knew what happened. Jesus knows who was healed. He wants the woman to come forward. Why? So that she can be an example to Jairus in this journey that he's going through and what's going to happen next. She wants him to be the, this example. Because, and he, there were a couple of reasons when I was reading the commentary why she was afraid and why she fell at his feet, why she was trembling. So there, there are three different options here, and I, th I think the third one's probably in line of what it was, but um, so the first one was she was afraid because she was unclean. Remember, she was social isolation for 12 years, and oh no, I touched Jesus, he's going to be like ritually impure, and I just did that to him. I know that I'm the cause of the problem here. Or two, um, back then they had people who were healers, and uh, you know, an offer of payment of money, they could be healed, kind of like this, I don't know, I don't know what you would call it, not magic, but they, they had healing powers and they could help, and they would offer payment for it. So she almost thought, oh no, I stole this power from him and did not pay, I'm stealing. Or three, it's kind of like what we saw with the disciples in the boat whenever Jesus calmed the storm and they were in fear. They were in awe of the power that he had. And I think that's what's happening here with her. She's in such awe of power, like she's healed and this is real, this is God, and I just experienced God. Because it wasn't Jesus' coat that healed the woman. Jesus said it. It was her faith. Her faith in Jesus was the real source of the healing. So I want you to think about that crowd being the obstacle. When we have those obstacles in our life and we are fighting, we're clawing, we're climbing towards Jesus through prayer, worship, reading the Bible, we're trying to be like him in our everyday life, there are definitely obstacles in the way. It can be a struggle or a fight at times. And there are times when we feel like Jesus isn't focused on us, he's not paying any attention to us, because we feel like we don't have what we're fighting for and others do. But Jesus showed the woman, I saw you. I saw your fight, I saw your struggle, I know what you're going through, but your faith in me healed you. Good job, well done. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. In our faith life, it's the same message. Jesus sees your fight. He sees your determination. He sees your need, your desperation to be with him. So keep it up. Don't stop. Don't let up. Keep pushing. Keep reaching out for Christ and for others to know Christ. Yes, the journey is tough. The fight can be difficult. There, there will be, and there are obstacles. But when you reach that relationship with Jesus one day, he's going to say the same thing to you. I saw you. I saw your fight. I saw your struggle. I know what you're going through. And your faith in me healed you. Good job. Well done. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Let's continue on in verses uh, 35 through 43. <clears throat> While Jesus was still speaking, some of the people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. 
but they laughed at him. After he pulled them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and they went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told her, or told them to give her something to eat. So we're getting closer to Jairus' house, and yet we see another set of obstacles. These messengers who come and tell Jairus and Jesus and the crowd that the little girl's dead. You don't need to bother Jesus anymore. You don't need to waste his time. There's no point in going inside. And Jairus kind of pulls, or Jesus pulls Jairus aside and says, do not fear, only believe. Once again, we have to be, there, there has to be the reason that the unnamed woman was here, part of this journey, to be that example of her and her faith. It was that example that Jesus is kind of saying, hey, remember this, remember her faith. So Jesus enters the house with Peter, James, and John, and he states that they shouldn't be upset that she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And they laugh at his statement before he, he asks them to leave, except for the father, mother, and three disciples. And then he takes the little girl's hand, restores her to life, just as the woman who touched the coat was healed. If we look back at Jairus' original request to Jesus, or of Jesus, he had confidence that if Jesus were to lay his hands on his daughter, then she would be healed. She would get well or be saved. The same as the unnamed woman believed that if she would get close enough to touch his clothes, then she would be healed too. Both of these things came true because of their strong faith in Christ and who he is and what he could do. Their faith, they had faith in their original request and then while fighting through these obstacles and during the action, their faith throughout this whole process is what brought the healing. It was their faith in Jesus. So today I want to end with, I like to do this every time I speak because even with the young people, I want you to take this and really think about your faith journey. Take time this week to think about where you are with Christ. Guys, we came out of a very hard, long, and difficult journey. All of us did. And personally, I can say that there were plenty of ups and downs within this faith journey of mine, so I know it has to be true for everybody else. There's no way you were on cloud nine the entire time. <laughs> but where are you at? Think about the three different people in the, the story. Think about, how faith, uh, think about how strong your faith in Jesus is right now. Are you one of those that's in the crowd? You're just curious about Jesus? You're close enough? You're kind of waiting to see what he can do? You're vaguely familiar with the stories, but nothing's really changed in your life? Or nothing's really been better by this passing acquaintance with Christ? Maybe you need to get to know him better. Maybe you're at square one. Maybe you are right where you started and you, you, you had a great relationship once before, but you desperately want to be happy with him again. You want to be in worship with him again, not just on Sunday morning, but all the time. You want to have a stronger prayer life. You want to be a better example of Christ to others. And you're fighting through these obstacles that life keeps throwing your way. If that's you, then keep fighting. Don't stop. Don't let anyone slow you down. And maybe you don't know him at all. Maybe you're, you're at the very beginning of this. And that's okay, too. But don't, you don't need to do it alone. There are other people that can help you fight through that crowd and, and get to know him. And um, talk to those people. Reach out to those people. Because there's nothing better than being right there with Christ. And this faith journey is tough. You're going to have ups and downs. But no, no matter where you are on this journey, you have to keep working to get closer to Jesus. Whether it's in your personal life, in your quiet moments, or whether it's being more plugged in here at the church, being more active in ministries, maybe it's getting plugged in with a small group, maybe you need an accountability partner. 
and you never lose that faith on, along this journey. Just never lose faith in the one who makes the possible things possible. Amen?